We are going to begin our presentation for this afternoon. Should I start? All right. Very good. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you once again, as we've done several times before, to ask that you will be with us in our study this afternoon. Not only the two this afternoon, but the one this evening as well. We ask that you will give, give us clarity of thought, because we've had lunch and uh, perhaps we're a little bit sleepy. Keep us awake and alert. And we thank you for the promise of your presence, and we claim that promise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to begin on page 315. The seventh seal, silence in heaven. And uh, I've already alluded to this, so I think you know what the seventh seal is, but we want to study several things relating to the period of the seventh seal. The description of the seventh seal is the shortest of all. It speaks about a, about a half an hour of silence in heaven. Now there's been some discussion among Seventh-day Adventist theologians about the meaning of this approximately half an hour. A half hour in symbolic time would, equival, would be equivalent to about seven and a half days. Some interpreters round off the seven and a half to seven. And they affirm that the second coming of Jesus will take seven days from beginning to end. The silence presumably will be because heaven is empty and uh, everybody has come, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the angels, everybody has come down to the earth, so supposedly heaven is empty. Although Ellen White never stated that the second coming would take seven days, she did write that from the time that Jesus moved from the most holy place to the east, there would be a period of several days, or a number of days. Let's read that statement. It's found in Maranatha, page 287. And I saw a flaming cloud come where Jesus stood. Then Jesus took His place on the cloud that carried Him to the east, where it first appeared to the saints on earth a small black cloud that was the sign of the Son of Man. While the cloud was passing from the holiest to the east, which took a number of days, the synagogue of Satan worshipped at the saints' feet. So from the time that God utters His voice, the 144,000 are delivered, and there's a special resurrection, Ellen White mentions that there is a number of days. Other interpreters believe that the half hour represents the seven days that God's people will take to travel back to heaven with Jesus after the second coming. And Ellen White does say that the trip to heaven will take seven days. In early writings, page 16, we find these words, We all entered the cloud together, and were seven days ascending to the sea of glass, when Jesus brought the crowns and with His own right hand placed them on our heads, He gave us harps of gold and palms of victory. So this indicates that the Feast of Tabernacles are going to be, is going to be celebrated in heaven. You're dealing with palm branches here. Leviticus 23 verse 40 mentions palm branches in connection with the Feast of Tabernacles. Now this cannot be correct either because the trip back to heaven is not going to be a silent event, it is going to be pretty noisy. Great Controversy 645 speaks about the journey back to heaven, which takes seven days. On each side of the cloudy chariot are wings, and beneath it are living wheels, and as the chariot rolls upward the wheels cry, Holy! And the wings as they move cry, Holy! And the retinue of angels cry, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And the redeemed shout, Alleluia, as the chariot moves onward toward the New Jerusalem. Pretty noisy event, isn't it? So it couldn't be silence in heaven for uh, these seven days because there's going to be lots of singing and celebrating. 
So neither of these interpretations is satisfactory. When it comes to prophetic time, God does not deal in approximations. Whenever He reveals a prophetic period of time, it is precise. What then is the meaning of the about a half an hour? The spirit of prophecy provides us what I believe to be the definitive meaning. The silence in heaven must bear some relationship to the question in the last part of the sixth seal. What is the last part of the sixth seal? What is the question? The great day of His wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? That's immediately before the seventh seal, right? The second part of the sixth seal is the avenging portion of the fifth seal. We've dealt with this before. Now God will turn the tables on those who oppressed, persecuted, and killed His people. As Jesus descends from heaven, the living saints, along with those who died in the faith of the third angel's message, ask the question, who shall be able to stand? Following the question, there is a period of awful silence in heaven. Are you seeing the connection? They ask the question, Revelation 6, 17, and then you have this period of awful silence. Now I believe that this period of awful silence, we don't apply the year-day principle to the almost half an hour. It is uh, literal at this point. So it's a, very, it's a short period. It's not a super long period, seven days, that God's people have to wait for the answer. Notice how Ellen White describes this moment of the awful silence in heaven. Great Controversy 641. Before His presence all faces are turned into paleness. Upon the rejectors of God's mercy falls the terror of eternal despair. The heart melteth and the knees smite together, and the faces of them all gather blackness. And of course those come from Jeremiah 36 in the book of Nahum chapter 2 and verse 10. The righteous cry with trembling, Who shall be able to stand? This is happening during the second coming, right? Jesus is on the way. Who shall be able to stand? The angel's song is hushed, and there is a period of what? Of awful silence. That's the seventh seal. Then the voice of Jesus is heard saying, My grace is sufficient for you. The faces of the righteous are lighted up, and joy fills every heart, and the angels strike a note higher and sing again as they draw still nearer to the earth. And then a little bit later on, the wicked will ask the same question. But the celebration is taking place already. The angels and the redeemed are singing the song. We find in Great Controversy 642, the very next um, page, the derisive jests have ceased. Lying lips are hushed into silence. The clash of arms, the tumult of battle, with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, is stilled. Do you notice also that, uh, that the wicked are going to be in silence? The righteous are singing according to what we just noticed, but the wicked, it says they're hushed into silence and they are stilled. Not now is heard but the voice of prayer and the sound of weeping and lamentation. The cry bursts forth from lips so lately scoffing. The great day of His wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? The wicked pray to be buried beneath the rocks of the mountains rather than meet the face of Him whom they have despised and rejected. Is this an allusion to the last part of the sixth, uh, the sixth seal? Yes or no? The, the, where it says here that uh, they want to be buried be, be beneath the rocks of the mountains? Yes, that's a description of the second part of the sixth seal. Notice that the question, who shall be able to stand, is following, followed immediately by an awful silence in heaven. Who can miss the fact that this is a commentary on Revelation 6, 17 and Revelation 8, verse 1? The question at the end of the sixth seal is followed by silence in heaven in the seventh. In a previous section we noticed several biblical passages where the same question appears, followed by a description of the sterling character of the righteous. Now we need to go back to something that we looked at at the very beginning of our study together when we dealt with the introductory vision. 
and that is the unfurling of the scroll that is mentioned in the, ha in the right hand of the one who is sitting on the throne. This is going to take us beyond the second coming of Christ, because the breaking of the seventh seal is not necessarily the unfurling of the scroll. Are you with me or not? So you have, you have this awful silence in heaven, that's the breaking of the seventh seal, but now we're going to look at the unfurling of the scroll which takes place after the seventh seal is broken. So what period is being pointed out here? We've already noticed this when we studied the introductory vision. The unfurling of the scroll takes place after the thousand years. So it's after the seventh seal is broken at the second coming. Now let's take a look at this. On our next page, page 318, we're going to notice the unfurling of the scroll of Revelation 5 has to do with post-millennial events. At this stage the lion of the tribe of Judah will unfurl the scroll to reveal the doom of the wicked. The Great Controversy, page 666 and forward, describes the white throne judgment. Jesus is sitting on this white throne above the holy city. As all nations are before the judgment bar of God, the scroll is finally opened before the entire universe, and every tongue will confess, and every knee will bow to the supremacy of Jesus. Great Controversy 668 and 669, as well as Philippians 2. Have you ever read where it says that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father? Well, that was fulfilled, uh, you know, when Jesus went to heaven, partially. But if you read Philippians 2, it says everybody in heaven and on earth and under the earth is singing this song of Philippians chapter 2. And by the way, the original source for Philippians 2, 5 through 11 is found in Isaiah 45, 23, which is in a judgment context of the nations. So this is the, this is the time that God is going to open up the records and He's going to show the wicked why they were lost. In Great Controversy 671, the white-robed throng that is before the throne sings the song of Revelation 5, verse 12. I want you to catch this point now. Do you remember that in the introductory vision we have the song of the angels, which is Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, and Revelation 5, verse 13? Remember we mentioned that? Does that totally and completely fulfill those verses during the introductory vision? No. Because if you notice Revelation chapter 5, and let's go there for a moment, Revelation chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, it wasn't fully fulfilled back then. In other words, it was partially fulfilled and it will be fulfilled completely at the time after the millennium. It says there in uh, Revelation chapter 5 and verse 12, let's read verse 11 for the context, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then verse 13, And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Was that fully and completely fulfilled during the introductory version where everyone in the universe is singing these songs? No. That's why Ellen White, here on page 671, she once again quotes Revelation 5, 12, and 13 to describe the song that is sung after the millennium. Because now all of creation is going to sing the fullest fulfillment of these verses that were mentioned in the introductory vision. So this is the moment toward which Revelation 5, 12 and 13 pointed in the introductory vision. And of course here, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28 will be finally consummated. Of course the big question is this, what does the sealed book contain? 
And why would it be so catastrophic for the book to remain sealed? Well, as I mentioned when we talked about the introductory vision, this uh, scroll contains the will, the last will and testament of the human race. Adam was the king of planet earth and this was his territory. He lost it to Satan. It was necessary for Jesus to pray, pay a price to buy it back so that he could eventually give it back to Adam and all of his descendants. And of course what the scroll reveals is who has a right to inherit what Adam lost. Who has accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that actually paid the ransom for the sin of the human race? I want you to notice on page 319, we're not going to read all of these statements again, but I want to read the one at the foot of page 319. A will according to the Praetorian Testament in Roman law bore the seven seals of the seven witnesses on the threads that secured the tablets or parchment. Such a testament could not be carried into execution till all the seven seals were loosed. Now let's stop there for a moment. Let me ask you this. Can just anyone open a will, unseal a will? Or is there someone who is worthy to unseal a will? There's somebody who has been delegated that has been given the responsibility to remove, so to speak, the seal from the will so that the will will reveal who inherits and what they inherit. That's what you have in this scroll. God's people, of course, are in heaven at this point. They came back to the earth and they have inherited what Adam lost. But now God is going to show the wicked the reason why they did not get the inheritance that Adam lost. I want you to notice uh, also a couple of statements on the next page, page 320. The central item, the seven sealed scroll, portrays a will or testament, for that is precisely what such a seven sealed document was in Roman law in John's day. We find then that the picture we have here, uh, we have in the subdivision of Revelation 4.1, through 8.1 is a court scene in which a will or testament is to be opened. In the context of Revelation, this will or testament will be, would be a title deed, as it were, to man's lost inheritance, an inheritance that has been repurchased by Christ, the Lamb. Thus the scroll is a book of destiny. The opening of it means inheritance in God's kingdom. Its remaining closed means forfeiture. No wonder John wept when he thought no one could open the scroll. Are you catching the picture? This is the, the will and testament of the human race. What would happen if this scroll remained sealed? No one would inherit. Now let's notice also two statements from Ellen White. There in his open hand, she clearly says that this scroll contains the whole history of the world, every decision that everyone made, that every nation made. There in his open hand lay the book, the role of the history of God's providences, the prophetic history of nations and the church. Herein was contained the divine utterances, His authority, His commandments, His laws, the whole symbolic counsel of the eternal, and the history of all ruling powers in the nations. In symbolic language was contained in that role the influence of every nation, tongue, and people from the beginning of earth's history to its close. So what you have there is the total history of the world contained in the scroll. Now there's another statement by Ellen White where she actually mentions one event that was recorded in the scroll. You know this statement that we just read is kind of just general. It's the role of the history of God's providences. It has the prophetic history of, nation, of the nations in the church. It has the history of all the ruling powers in the nations. It gives the history of the world from beginning to end. That's basically a general statement. But now she gives a statement where she specifies a specific event that was recorded in that scroll. Christ's Object Lessons, page 294. 
Thus the Jewish leaders made their choice. That is when they said, release unto us Barabbas and crucify Christ, and we have no king but Caesar. Their decision was registered in the book which John saw in the hand of him that sat upon the throne, the book which no man could open. In all its vindictiveness, this decision will appear before them in the day when this book is unsealed by the lion of the tribe of Judah. So we have one historical event that Ellen White mentions that was written in the scroll that is going to be unsealed, I like that word unsealed, that is going to be unsealed after the millennium so that all of the wicked can see the reason why they were lost. Now several important points emerge from this statement of Ellen White. Ellen White is writing about the year 1900, that's when Christ's Object Lessons was actually published. It is clear that at this point the scroll was still sealed, would you agree with that? Because she says when the scroll will be opened, so in other words it wasn't open at this point. Furthermore, in order for those who cried out, release unto us Barabbas, to see the consequences of the decision they made in the past, they must what? They have to be alive, so they have to what? Resurrect. When is it that all the wicked are going to resurrect? After the millennium. So when is the scroll opened? After the millennium. Is that after the breaking of the seventh seal, after the silence in heaven? It most certainly is. This means that the scroll will remain sealed until they resurrect in the second resurrection after the millennium. Now I want us to notice a couple of verses two or three verses in Revelation chapter 20. Do you know that Revelation chapter, um, chapter 20 contains both the millennial judgment and the post-millennial judgment? Do you, do you realize that the books will be opened during the thousand years, the scroll will be shown to God's people during the thousand years, because we're going to see why the wicked were lost and we're going to dictate sentence, right? Judgment was committed to those, it says in Revelation chapter 20 verse 4, who were beheaded for the word of God, the testimony of Jesus, did not worship the beast or his image or receive his mark. So there's a millennial judgment, but there is also a post-millennial judgment in Revelation chapter 20. Let's notice this, Revelation chapter 20, and let's read verse beginning with verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no, found no place for them. This is the second coming of Christ. Do the heavens, um, you know, do they, um, how, how, how would I say it? Do they roll up like a scroll at the second coming of Christ? Absolutely. Uh, is, is, uh, is the earth found in its place? No. Verse 11 is describing the second coming of Christ. By the way, when Jesus returns, does He re return on a throne? What does Revelation 6 say? Hide us from the one who is seated where? On the throne. So in Revelation 19 He comes on a horse, in Revelation chapter 6 He comes on a throne, so you say there's a contradiction there. No, it's talking about function. The horse means that Jesus is a conquering uh, general of the armies. In Revelation chapter 6 it means that He is king of His kingdom. Are you with me or not? So it's talking about function. So the, uh, verse 11 is speaking about the second coming of Christ. And then verse 12 is referring to the millennial judgment. And I saw the dead. The what? The dead. The dead. Which dead? Well it has to be the lost, because the, all of the righteous dead resurrected before the thousand years. So it says, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. How can dead people stand before God? <coughs> Through their records, that's right. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead, not those who are living, but the dead were what? Were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. That is the millennial judgment. But then I want you to notice in verse 13, you have the books opened again. But when they're opened again, the wicked have resurrected after the thousand years. It says in verse 13, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, 
and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. What does it mean that death and Hades delivered up the dead? People are what? The wicked are resurrecting. And then it says, and they were judged, each one according to his what? So is there a post-millennial judgment also? Absolutely. And then comes the punishment. It says in verse 14, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And some people say, well, why does the book of life come to view after the thousand years? Well, it comes to view to show why the wicked weren't in it. God is going to take the, the book of life. He's going to say, see, you're not in here. Do you want to know why you're not in here? Because of what's in the books. Because of what the panorama reveals. And so it says, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now Ellen White describes this fantastic scene after the thousand years. In great controversy, I've read this before, but I think that we need to read it again because now we're dealing with the seventh seal, and it's been a while since we dealt with the introductory vision. So, great controversy, it's page 666 to 669. Above the throne is revealed the cross, and like a what? Panoramic view, and I've added in brackets, in high death. Appear the scenes, where does, the, where, where does it start? Appear the scenes of what? Adam's temptation and fall. What else? And the successive steps in the great plan of redemption. Is that the whole history of the world? Yes. The Savior's lowly birth, now comes the list. The Savior's lowly birth, His early life of simplicity and obedience, His baptism in the Jordan, the fast and temptation in the wilderness, His public ministry, unfolding to men heaven's most precious blessings, the days crowded with deeds of love and mercy, the nights of prayer and watching in the solitude of the mountains, the plotting of envy, hate, and malice, which re, um, and ma let's see, and malice, which repaid His benefits, the awful mysterious agony in Gethsemane, beneath the crushing weight of the sins of the whole world, his betrayal into the hands of the murderous mob, the fearful events of that night of horror, the unresisting prisoner forsaken by his best loved disciples, rudely carried through the streets of Jerusalem, the Son of God exultingly displayed before Annas, arraigned in the high priest's palace, in the judgment hall of Pilate, before the cowardly and cruel Herod, mocked, insulted, tortured, and condemned to die, all are what? Vividly portrayed. The movie. <laughs> Could we make a, a fantastic movie out of all of this? Oh, could we ever? And it's not an imaginary thing. It's what really happened. And what, re what will really happen. But, but the life of Christ, is our, are they seeing the entire life of Christ? Every detail? Yes, and now before the swaying multitude are revealed the final scenes. The patient sufferer treading the path to Calvary, the prince of heaven hanging upon the cross, the haughty priests and the jeering rabble deriding his expiring agony, the supernatural darkness, the heaving earth, the rent rocks, the open graves, marking the moment when the world's Redeemer yielded up his life. The awful spectacle appears just as it was. Wow! What kind of technology are we talking about here? Satan, his angels, and his subjects have no power to turn from the picture of their own work. Each actor recalls the part that he performed. Herod, who slew the innocent children of Bethlehem, that he might destroy the king of Israel. The base Herodias, upon whose guilty soul rests the blood of John the Baptist. The weak time-serving Pilate, the mocking soldiers, the priests and rulers, and the maddened throng who cried, His blood be on us and on our children. All behold the enormity of their guilt. They vainly seek to hide from the divine majesty of His countenance, outshining the glory of the sun, while the redeemed cast their crowns at the Savior's feet, exclaiming, He died for me. So then it, Ellen White turns to the period of the apostles. Amid the ransom throng are the apostles of Christ, the heroic Paul the ardent Peter, the loved and loving John, and the true-hearted brethren, and with them the vast host of martyrs, while outside the walls, with every vile and abominable thing, 
are those by whom they were persecuted, imprisoned, and slain. So you have kind of a reversal, don't you, here? There is Nero, that monster of cruelty and vice, beholding the joy and exaltation of those whom he once tortured, and in whose extremest agony he found satanic delight. His mother is there to witness the result of her own work, to see how the evil stamp of character transmitted to her son, the passions encouraged and developed by her influence and example, have borne fruit in crimes that cause the world to shudder. Then she turns to the period of papal supremacy. Are you, are you following uh, what, what this scroll contains? There are papist priests and prelates who claim to be Christ's ambassadors, yet employed the rack, the dungeon, and the stake to control the consciences of His people. There are the proud pontiffs who exalted themselves above God and presumed to change the law of the Most High. Those pretended fathers of the church have an account to render to God for, for, from which they would fain be excused. Too late they are made to see that the omniscient one is jealous of his law and that he will in no wise clear the guilty. They learn now that Christ identifies his interest with that of his suffering people and they feel the force of his own words, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. The whole wicked world stand arraigned at the bar of God. On charge of what? On charge of high treason against the government of heaven. They have none to plead their cause, they are without excuse, and the sentence of eternal death is pronounced against them. Quite a vivid description, isn't it, of the moment when the scroll is unfurled. So we've dealt with the entire sweep of the seven seals. They're not so difficult to understand, are they? Actually quite easy when you apply historicist principles. You start in Revelation 4 and 5, and in Revelation chapter 4 and 5 you have the inaugural vision. There present in the heavenly throne room is the Father sitting on His throne, cherubim and seraphim are there, the seven lamps of fire, the Holy Spirit is there, the four living creatures are there, the twenty-four elders, the representatives of the worlds, they're all gathered there. And the heavenly hosts are singing a song of praise to the one who is sitting on the throne, and the song has to do with the Creator. Missing in chapter 4 are the angelic hosts, and the Lamb, Jesus Christ, because they are on their way to heaven. And then in chapter 5, you have the angel hosts arriving, and Jesus Christ arriving with them. And now, as they enter the gates of the city, they're singing praises to the Lord. Hallelujah! And they're singing these songs that we find in Revelation chapter 5, in verses 11 to 13. And then suddenly, Jesus raises His hand, or His hands, and He says, Shh, wait, I have to go before My Father. I have to make certain, I have, everybody needs to know that My sacrifice has been accepted. So He approaches the Father, and He speaks those words of John 17, Father, I wish that those You have given Me will be with Me where I am. And now the Father embraces His Son, and he says, your sacrifice is accepted, you will be able to bring your brothers and sisters home. And then the Father's voice is heard saying, worship Him, all the hosts of heaven. And now suddenly there's an explosion of praise. And then Jesus is clothed with the garments of the high priest, which we haven't dealt with. It's in Leviticus 8 and Psalm 133. There's a limit to what we can study. He's invested as the high priest, and he sits on the throne of grace, and now begins the Christian dispensation. And so then you have the first horse, the white horse, representing the apostolic church after the day of Pentecost. The church goes out conquering and to conquer. Thousands upon thousands are coming into the church. Paganism is losing its subjects. And now Satan says, if this continues, paganism is going to disappear. 
all of my followers are going to become Christians. He says, I got to do something about this. So then you have the red horse, the horse of bloodshed. Satan says, I know how I'll get rid of these. I will persecute them. I will influence the Roman emperors to come after them and to kill them if they refuse to follow the religion, the pagan religion of the Roman Empire. But the plan backfires because Satan sees that the church is growing even faster than before he began the persecutions. He says, this isn't working. I'm going to have to go to a plan B. And so now he says, if you can't fight them, join them. And so now you have the black horse, the horse of darkness, because we saw that darkness and blackness in the Bible symbolize the fact that the Word of God is not there. There's a scarcity of bread. In other words, there's hunger because the traditions of men have replaced the Word of God. And now the church embraces the world. The church becomes culturally conditioned. The church now uh, becomes politically correct. And it wants to be accepted by the empire. And the world walks into the church. And the church becomes corrupted. And as a result, there's famine because there's a scarcity of the Word of God. And the light of the church grows dim because you have the black horse, the horse of darkness. So Satan says, well, this is, uh, this is working quite well. But he notices that there are certain individuals who will not adopt the customs of paganism. There's a small remnant that refuse to be infiltrated. And so Satan says, I have to do something about this. So then you have the yellow horse which is the horse of death. Death and Hades follow this horse. So the idea now is to kill people, first of all spiritually, by famine, and then to kill them physically through mechanisms such as the Inquisition if they don't agree with the teachings and practices of the church. And so during this period you have millions and millions of martyrs that are being slain for the Word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Are you following me? And so now a great injustice has been performed because the, the righteous die and the unrighteous live. The little horn prospered. Power was given to the little horn to oppress the saints of the Most High. What justice is there in this? There's no justice. The human courts have made wrong decisions. They've condemned the righteous and they have justified the wicked. And so now the martyrs under the fifth seal cry out and they say, How long, O Lord, do you not judge and avenge our blood which is shed by this system on the earth? I'm paraphrasing, obviously. And then each one of these martyrs who died during the period of papal supremacy is given a white robe. This is a way in which God says, your case is secure, don't worry, you have the white robe. And by the way, we receive that white robe before Jesus comes. Are you aware of that? Do you remember the parable that we find in Matthew chapter 22 of the man who sneaked into the wedding chamber without a garment? And then the judge comes and he says, how did you sneak in here without the garment? Does that mean anyone is going to sneak in heaven, into heaven at the second coming? No. It means that there are counterfeit Christians. Counterfeit Christians that have their name written in the book, but when the books are open, it will be shown that they were counterfeit Christians. Because the church has true and counterfeit. Does the church have wise and foolish virgins? Does the church have wheat and tares? Does the church have good and bad fish? Does the church have individuals who say, Lord, Lord, didn't we perform miracles in your name and cast out demons in your name and prophesied in your name? And Jesus is going to say, well, because you had my name, come. No, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Is there in the church a group of people who have the form of godliness but don't have the true power of godliness in their lives? Yes, so does God have to make a work of separation between the righteous and the unrighteous? Absolutely. So what God does with the martyrs, He says to them, and obviously they're dead, but this is a figurative thing. He says to these martyrs, don't worry, your case is secure, you're fine. 
you're going to be judged and you're going to be avenged. And so they're given white robes. That means that they're covered with the righteousness of Christ. They're okay. And so that is the cry of the martyrs under the fifth seal. Now, is there going to be a judgment in heaven that will reveal in heaven, in the investigative judgment, that these individuals were faithful and their oppressors were wicked? Yes, that is the judge part of the fifth seal. But also we have an avenge part. When does the avenging take place? It takes place at the time of the sixth seal. And so now the martyrs are crying out. God tells them, your case is secure. Don't worry about it. But you're going to have to rest for a while. Because there's going to be another group of martyrs in the future. And when that number of martyrs is complete, then I will avenge you. So the fifth seal has how many stages? It has two stages. The first stage is the martyrs of the past. The second stage is the martyrs of the future. The purpose of the judgment in heaven is to uh, do the judging first, to show that God's people are worthy of being saved. That's done while they're still dead. How many stages do we have in the sixth seal? And so now in the sixth seal there are signs uh, like the great earthquake of Lisbon and uh, the, the sun darkened and the moon turning like blood and the stars falling from heaven, 1780, 1833. And what is the purpose of these signs? To announce that the judging portion of the fifth seal is about to begin. Now the investigative judgment is going to begin in 1844. The Millerite movement is going to announce it. And so now, uh, in 1844, the judging portion begins, and beginning with those who died, including all of those who died, but the martyrs in the case of Revelation chapter 5 and 6, all of their cases are examined, and in the heavenly court, a judgment is pronounced in favor of the saints of the Most High, in favor of the martyrs who died because of their faith. Have they been avenged yet? No, they haven't been avenged yet. They've been judged worthy of eternal life in the heavenly court, in the investigative judgment, but it still remains for them to be what? Avenged. Let me ask you, is there going to be under the sixth seal signs in the heavens again? Is there going to be a great earthquake? We notice this. Is, there going, is the sun going to be darkened? Is the moon going to be darkened? Are the stars going to be darkened? Yes. What does this announce? It announces that the oppression of all of the martyrs, those who died in the first stage and the second stage, now they are going to be what? They are going to be avenged by the second coming of Jesus. They will live and the wicked will perish. Now is there a sealing that takes place before the great time of trouble? Yes, that's the interlude. The sealing of the final generation that protects them during the time of trouble. And then, as Jesus descends from heaven, He's avenged those who died because He's punished the harlot. Revelation 19, 1 and 2 says that He has avenged their blood, the, the, the blood of the martyrs, upon the harlot. Then, as Jesus descends, there is an awful period of silence. The saints ask, who shall be able to stand? The answer is a period of silence. That's the seventh seal. And then a voice is heard saying, My grace is sufficient for you. And then, this isn't mentioned directly in the seals. It alludes to the second coming by the awful period of silence. Then Jesus descends from heaven. He resurrects those who died before 1844. And they are caught up along with the saints who resurrected in the special resurrection, along with the 144,000 living saints, they are caught up in the clouds to meet Jesus in the air. And then Jesus will transfer them to heaven for a working vacation. <laughs> It'll be nice to be in heaven, but we're going to have work for a thousand years. The Bible says that the righteous will now sit on thrones. See, the tables have been turned. Now they rule. 
whereas previously the rulers finished them off. And so now, with Jesus, they will sit on thrones. The books will be opened of all of the wicked, wicked people that remain behind. And the righteous will be able to see why those outside the city, who will be outside the city, were not saved. And not only that, they will also, along with Jesus, pronounce the length of the sentence of the individuals according to their works. After every case has been examined in the heavenly judgment, the heavenly jury has pronounced sentence, then Jesus says, it's time to go back home. And I say Jesus because this is Jesus' home too. You know, he became incarnate here. And so Jesus now, with all of the saints, descends from heaven, uh, once again with a shout, undoubtedly with singing and joyful, uh, joyful celebration, and he comes down with all of the redeemed from all ages from heaven down to the earth. The holy city descends as well. The feet of Jesus rest upon the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is split in two, and you have this large plain upon which the holy city, New Jerusalem, will rest. Then Jesus and the saints enter the gates of the city, and the gates are shut. The wicked who have resurrected, Satan tells them, Hey, I, I was the one who resurrected you. So imagine, I have the power. Look at them inside. They're the few. We are the many. We are much more than them. The book of Revelation describes the wicked as the sand of the sea. I mean, Ellen White in Great Controversy says that the, the troops outside the city, the number of the troops are equal to the number of all of the soldiers that have fought in all of the wars in the history of planet earth. That's millions and millions. And so Satan gathers with his angels, they plan how they're going to overcome the city, he meets with the great military leaders of the world, they start building uh, the infrastructure of the world, because everything has been ruined when, when Jesus came, and they have to build powerful weapons, they're not going to attack the city with bows and arrows and with swords, it's going to be with sophisticated weapons. And now they're ready to attack the city, they say, we can gain the victory over it. Up to this point, Satan is deceiving the nations. Have you read in Revelation 20 where it says that he will go out to deceive the nations? So now he goes out and he says, that city is ours. Inside, the one inside is a usurper. We can conquer that city. We're much more than the ones inside. So everybody prepares for battle. And they march, the, the armies march across the surface of the earth with military precision. See, they went to boot camp. It's going to take a while to organize an army such as that. They're not going to just attack the city uh, willy-nilly without any preparation. They prepare. They prepare a strategy. And when they're about to attack the holy city, the scroll is unfurled. They're outside the city, and now this scroll that was in the hand, of, on the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne, is going to be unfurled before them. And that's what we read from Great Controversy 666 to 669. They will see all of the history of the world, how Adam and Eve sinned, the flood, all of the stories of the Old Testament, the period of Israel, the prophets, the period of the Hebrew kings, John the Baptist, the coming of Jesus, all of the events of the life of Jesus, the final scenes of his life, all will be seen. And then the history will pass on to the period of the early church. The Paul and all of the other apostles, all of the leaders of the church are seen in this panoramic view. And then you have the period of the Middle Ages, the period when popes and princes and prelates persecuted God's people. It's all presented vividly in this panoramic view. And even though Ellen White doesn't mention it, there's no doubt whatsoever that we're also going to see the scenes that took place after the Dark Ages, after the Middle Ages, because we're going to be able to see the entire history of the world from beginning to end. When Satan and his angels and the wicked see this panoramic view, 
The wicked suddenly awaken from their slumber, from their anesthesia, and they suddenly look at Satan and they say, you are the one. You are the guilty one. You're a deceiver. And many people think that the wicked are going to be destroyed as they attack the holy city. The wicked never attack the holy city. They prepare to attack the holy city. The armies come together to attack the holy city. They never attack the holy city. When they see that Satan has deceived them, they turn at Satan and they say, you are the guilty one. And Ellen White states that the wicked will avalanche themselves upon Satan as wild beasts. Wow. But God in His mercy will cause fire to descend from heaven to consume Satan and his angels and the wicked. And after each one receives the reward according to their works, according to what we read in Revelation chapter 20, it's simple justice. Depending on the crime is the sentence and the punishment, right? Not all crimes are punished equally because not all are as serious as others. And so now fire descends from heaven and it consumes Satan and his angels and the wicked. And after a period of time, they're reduced to ashes. And then the earth is cleansed by the fire. And God will create or recreate, what we might say, a new heavens and a new earth on which righteousness dwells. What will be the sign of the new creation? The Sabbath. What was the sign of the original creation? Sabbath. What was the sign of redemption? Where did Jesus rest? In the tomb. Which day? The Sabbath. Which day will be the day to go to worship God because new heavens and new earth have been created? The Sabbath. It shall be from, from new moon to new moon. People get hung up with that new moon. You know, they say, oh, we got to celebrate the feast. No, new moon simply means month. From month to month. Why are we going to go to the presence of God from month to month? Because there is a tree that produces its fruit every month. You see, the tree of life functions as a battery charger. <laughs> we don't have inherent life. Not even Adam and Eve before they sinned. They had to continue eating from the tree of life to continue living. Why did uh, those individuals before the flood live to be almost a thousand years old? Because they had a fully charged battery. <laughs> but as time has gone by, the battery has been depleted, and as a result, people live a lot shorter lives. If God allowed the human race to continue in existing, eventually it would extinguish itself. The vitality would be gone. So God's people will go, like Adam and Eve would have done in the Garden of Eden, from month to month to eat from the tree of life. And you know, God is a, is a God of variety. You know, it's not going to be the same fruit every month. You know, one month it will probably be mangoes. <laughs> I'm speculating now. Another month it might be oranges. Another month apples. Another month pears. Who knows? But each month it will be a different fruit. But we will not only go from month to month. We will also go from Sabbath to Sabbath to commemorate the creation of new heavens and new earth. That's what Isaiah 66 verses 22 and 23 says. So let me ask you, has God changed in His plan for the day of worship? I mean, how much sense does it make to say, in Genesis it was the Sabbath. With Israel and the manna it was the Sabbath. In the fourth commandment, the Sabbath. When Jesus came to this earth, the Sabbath. The apostles in the book of Acts, they kept the Sabbath. 
in the new heavens and new earth, the Sabbath, but meanwhile Sunday. Doesn't work. The Sabbath has been God's sign all throughout human history. And today it's very common to find articles in the newspaper where people, uh, you know, they say, we need to get back to keeping the Sabbath. But they're not talking about the seventh day, they're talking about Sunday as if it was a Sabbath. That's a misnomer. You can't call Sunday the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the seventh day, Sunday is the first day. And some people even play tricks with calendars. You know, they'll, they'll start the week with Monday. So if you start the week with Monday, what is the seventh day? Sunday. Oh, really crafty, isn't it? That doesn't work. Because if Sunday is the seventh day, it doesn't square with the Bible because the Bible tells us that Jesus resurrected the first day, not the seventh. <laughs> so you can prove biblically that this is totally wrong. Somebody says, but pastor, how do you know that uh, the Sabbath that exists today is the same Sabbath of the times of Christ? And so what I ask these people, I ask, well, what day of the week do you keep? They say, well, we keep uh, Sunday. I say, why do you keep Sunday? Well, because Jesus resurrected that day. I say, oh, so you're telling me that Sunday today is the sa same Sunday that Jesus resurrected. Well, if Sunday today is the same day that Jesus resurrected, then Sabbath is the same day Sabbath that he rested in the tomb. And then they say, how do you know that the Sabbath today is the same Sabbath of creation? And I simply say, because Jesus kept the Sabbath and he wasn't, he wasn't going to keep the wrong day. So people offer all kinds of excuses to be disobedient to God and substitute their own ideas. So let me ask you, would this panorama that I've described as we finish our study of the seven seals, we're going to deal with uh, still the seal of God, would it make a, a fantastic movie? I just gave you the script. <laughs> I already, you know, I've been playing around with the idea in my mind. You know, I'm not a script writer, but I have lots of interesting ideas. Who knows? Let's pray so that the Lord will guide, if this is His will, that it will become a reality so that many can know what the Bible really says about the end times.